Well, everybody, glad to see you at sort of the first pizza meeting of my uh, club, if you will. Uh, this guy's one of my favorites. Uh, he, he's my ace in the hole, and he's always got something interesting up his sleeve. I didn't know Calkins was going to tell us if it's worth proving. Okay, so for many years, I used to teach a course that we taught for incoming graduate students, which uh, I taught with Colin Gallagher for a while, and then with Pete Kiesler, and we used to lovingly call it boot camp. Uh, also known as all math you missed but needed to know for graduate school. And we would teach them linear algebra, real analysis, complex analysis, statistics, probability, go through all the stuff you really need to know when you're starting graduate school at Clemson. It was very much tailored for graduate students starting here. And I apparently got known for a catchphrase. And the catchphrase was, if it's worth proving, it's worth proving in more than one way. So if you've heard other people, other graduate students repeating that around here, other professors even, it's quite possible they picked it up from you. So I'm gonna give you a talk on if it's worth proving. But I'm going to prove some things that you probably know already. You may see some new things, but it won't be new results. So hopefully, some of the proofs will not be. So hopefully, it will not be the case that you've seen all of the proofs before. Um, in some sense, I'm only going to show you finitely many proofs. In one sense, I'm actually going to show you uncountably many proofs, but they're not very different. One. Uh, this, there are finitely many really different proofs, and then there's, there's one big uncountable set of proofs that I may get to. Okay, so I want to start with something that uh, I'm teaching linear algebra at the moment. Of course, in linear algebra, we talk about multiplying matrices together. And fairly early on, we learned that matrix multiplication is associative. That uh, is A, B, C is equal to A, B, C. Of course, matrix multiplication is a binary operation. We're multiplying two matrices together. So if we're multiplying three, or get three together, we have to figure out which way we do the first pairwise multiplication. And so the obvious proof if I were to just say to students just go away and prove this, they'd say, well, what's the IJ's entry in that? Uh, I don't want to do this. We'd have to figure out what the IJ, uh, sorry, it's the what is it? It's the sum over k, whatever this range is, depends on the size of the matrices, of a, b, i, k, c, k, j. And then, uh, I still don't want to do it. Right? That is the sum over k, the inner sum there will be sum over L of A, I, L, B, L, K. G, K, J. Oh, I've only just gone over the edge and it's still visible on the That takes some time. Okay, so, and then we say multiplication of numbers, to mean these are real matrices, the entries of numbers, Multiplication of numbers is associative, and so I can expand this piece here out and say that it's independent of the order in which we do things, and then I can unpack it and go backwards and get that this is indeed 
a b c i j. Ugly. As Hardy once said, there is no permanent place in this world for ugly mathematics. I agree. Well, actually, sometimes ugly mathematics is useful, but you know, there are those of us who are pure mathematicians and we have higher standards. I mean, writing papers and statistics these days. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's give a better proof. And I want to discuss why it's a better proof. This, this proof is perfectly valid and it gets to the meat of things and it does it in an ugly way. I want to say it's an M by M matrix. A and M by M matrix corresponds to precisely a linear transformation from Rn to Rm. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them, and everything works nicely. In the appropriate uh, algebraic realm, it's an isomorphism between two objects. And here, This is a function. Matrix multiplication corresponds to functional composition. And there, there are two different, there, there are the two ways of composing functions. I have the parens in. This is F composed with G, like, I mean, next to one. H, all right, I know I need to treat paren. H, all right. So this is saying that F composed with G composed with H, all X. Is equal to f composed with g composed with h of x. So when you unpack them both, it's really just diagram pushing to see that they both are f of g of h of x. So there's no way to put the parenthesis in this expression. So this is a much cleaner, slicker proof. This one works. But this illustrates that we're really we're working in a better object over here. We shouldn't be thinking about matrices. We should be thinking about linear transformations, which is why in 3110 we introduce all these ideas of linear transformations because it really makes things a lot more natural and prettier, and using for students. Okay, so there's my first example of two different proofs. With a very different feel to them. Neither of them is particularly difficult, but one of them I think is plainly better. Okay, so I'm going to move on to a completely different realm. Um, some of you know I love number theory. And I'm going to tell you an unsurprising fact that you may have seen at some point in your checkered history. Nice theorem. There are infinitely many primes. How many of you have seen this theorem before? How many of you can prove it? How many of you can prove it twice? Two different ways. Three, four, five. One. I think you know, you know, Christian books. 
I'm not really good at that. Okay, it's, it's very unusual. I'm going to do it. Um, okay, so nuclear. First, first. Uh, he said, suppose that there are only finite event primes, then we will, like, it's usually presented as he said, suppose there are only finite many primes, then we obtain a contradiction. Apparently, I've, I've been looking for another paper that actually goes back and looks at the original and says, no, this is misunderstood. It, it was better proof than that. But we'll present what's often shown as. Only by making many E one, E two, E K, and E one, E two, E K plus one as prime factor. Sometimes people misunderstand this and think that it means that actually P1 through PK plus one must itself must itself be a prime. But that's not the case. So let's modify this slightly. Let's take PK plus one to be the least prime factor of P1 through PK plus one, because this number is co-prime to all of these factors, PK plus one must be a new prime. Then this is actually an infinite list of primes. And, and this is a fundamentally different proof than this one, even though they're almost identical, in that this just says there does not exist a complete finite set of primes. This says actually here is a way of constructing a list of infinitely many primes. So the first proof, almost the same. Replace the plus one by a minus one, but you have to actually specify the first couple of factors. So P1 times P2 is six, subtract one, you get five, so P3 is five, and then from there on, it'll work exactly the same way. You, you just have to make sure you don't try and find a prime factor of one at the beginning. That means the k prime is less than p1, p2 up to pk minus one. And I will show you how this is actually somewhat nicer. And I'm sorry for those uh, 
somebody would like to control your camera, that would mean you can move it around and see yeah, where I'm writing. Yeah, I'll give you control. I give you control. Sorry, I have completely forgotten after this board to move to here. And they have successfully moved to see that. Okay, now I'm going to go back to the beginning board and use what I've just done over there. So I'm going to make something slightly easier. I'm going to look at the sequence that starts out with equality and it starts out two and two. two, and two and two. So we have a sequence that is actually a quality here. <coughs> I'm, I'm starting out with two and three. Sorry? Uh, you mean, uh, two, two, or three. I want two. Okay. Just because it makes the analysis a little easier. Okay. Uh, it's it's not hard to do with two and three, and, the, and in that case, this is obvious. Um, but if you analyze this and look at the first couple of terms, it's clear that everything dominates after that. So this will actually work. The analysis is trivial, though. So this is equal to. U and minus one squared. So we can actually write down the x term and We see that we actually get a bound on the size of the x prime. It's less than two to the two to the x. And I don't want to get into the details. If anybody's interested, I can certainly fill in the details later. Uh, this is for n. N is one. It's yeah. It's true. So that means that. Phi of x equal to the number of primes less than or equal to x for large x is phi of x is less than <coughs> is greater than log log x. <laughs> That's ridiculously low and not about as a low bound, but it gives us a growth, it gives us a growth rate in how many primes there are. So these, these are really three sides of the same point. I've just manipulated it slightly to, to, to get some nice bounds out. And you can do the same thing with, with this one, and this one really is the same. Thing. Let me show you a different proof. Um, this one is, is due to somebody whose name you've probably heard, Goldbach. Because he's famous for writing a letter to Euler saying, I, I, I believe it's true that every even number bigger than four is the sum of two primes, which is certainly true. We don't have a proof, but it is certainly true. Morally, there is no way it can be false. And I would not be surprised if in your lifetime you see a proof. If it's soon, it will probably be by Harold Helfgott. So Keep an eye out for Harold Helfgott, just in case he proves the Goldbach conjecture. 
Uh, there's a similar problem, the infinity of twin primes. And if we see a proof of that in my lifetime, it's likely to be by James Maynard. So remember, if you if you see those two facts proved in the near future, then the names are right, you heard it here first. Okay, but a proof of the infinity of primes by Goldbach, he, he said Fermat numbers. Fn equals two to two the n plus one. We think of Fermat as this absolutely brilliant, genius mathematician, which he was. He was also capable of being very wrong. So Fermat believed that all numbers of this form were prime, and the first few are. And the next one that he couldn't handle isn't. And we don't know of any more that are. So he's not only wrong. He was about as wrong as can be. And there are good reasons not to expect any more of them to be prime. If we think about how many primes there are up to X and try and distribute them randomly, we only expect to see finitely many primes of this form. If we do a probability class. Okay, so Fn divides fn plus one minus two because it's a difference if we subtract off two we get a minus one instead of a plus one we get a difference of two squares one of them is fn but in fact fn plus one minus two is fn F n minus two. That's the other factor. So that's equal to F n F n minus one F n minus one minus two. And we continue that, and we see that. Um, GCD up the GCD of FM and FN equal to one if M is not equal to N. Because if N is greater than M, FM divides FN minus two, and they're both odd, so they have no common factor. Know that e be the p n be the least prime factor of oh that's p n indices should match. We take the least prime factor of f n, call it p n p one p two p n is an infinite list. Nice. Notice that that feels somewhat different from this. Do something similar with Mersenne numbers, but you have to take, take care, and it doesn't actually give you as much as you might hope. I'm not going to do that. Um, oh, one thing I should note here if
divides that n, then two to the two to the n minus one, the two to the two to the n is common to the minus one mod p. Just rewriting what it means to divide it. So if we square that, we get plus one mod p, which means that the order of p, so the order of two mod p is a divisor of two to the n plus one. And it can't be anything smaller than two to the n plus one because it's not two to the n. The only biases of two to the n plus one are two to the k for k less than two to the n plus one. So we know the exact order of two mod p. So this means that in particular for any fixed k, all primes from some point on in this sequence will be going to one mod two to the k. So in fact, you're going to one mod much higher powers of two, but in particular, this power of two. So we get infinitely many primes in one of the congruence classes that's harder to deal with than minus one mod four, for example. There's a very simple proof there, infinitely many primes going to minus one mod four, it's a little harder to find there in many comments than one mod four. Well, this is it. This is a, a, a simple proof of it. And it goes back to Goldberg. Okay. Let's see. Furstenberg, who in the last year or two was awarded the Abel Prize in mathematics for a lifetime. Essentially, it's the, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize. There is no Nobel Prize in mathematics. The Arvo Prize is for a lifetime's contribution. Unlike the Fields Medal, which is for contributions by a young mathematician, the Arvo Prize is a substantial body of work over time. And um, uh, he's done a lot of stuff with ergodicity and various topological ideas. Uh, and, and he has a lovely proof. He says, consider the integers. And we will put a topology on the integers. And consider the topology generated by all arithmetic progressions. And by arithmetic progressions, I don't mean finite, I mean two way infinite arithmetic progressions. So one, three, five, seven, and so would be minus one, minus three, minus five, minus seven. It stands out to infinity in both directions. It's easy to see this is a topology. Um, So we'll define a p to be the set of p n where n is in z and this is for p prime and let a be union over all primes of a p 
at all multiples of any prime. A complement is the numbers plus and minus one. So it should be fairly clear that this is not a union of arithmetic progressions. So this is not open. A is not closed. But if only finitely many times. So, if you don't know about topology, this proof will not amuse you. If you do know about topology, it's very amusing. I, I hear Jim Chuck. Have you seen this one before? No, it's my new flavor. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> Gives us absolutely no information about the number of fronts. It's a completely different proof, but it gives us no new information about the number of fronts. Okay, I, I want to give one more proof of this. And then I'll move on to what I really want to talk about. Okay, so Euler, matrix to master of us all, or master of everything is another interpretation, and I don't know what which interpretation was meant in the original phrase. Series of ideas. Um, I'm going to be a little bit more careful. Uh, S goes to one from above. S goes to one from above. But they're equal if S is greater than one. So this diverges. Uh, so x, the sum of one over p, p prime, diverges. So put the x in. Uh, x goes to one from above. So this is sort of an. This is a topological proof. This is almost a group theoretic proof. This is an analytic proof. Let's see what this one buys us. The sum of one over P diverges. Let me write that as P sub N. And that's all over all primes. Okay. Well, if that diverges,
that can't always be bigger than n times log n to the one plus epsilon because the sum of the reciprocal of that does diverge. So infinitely often, Tn must be less than n log n, uh, which implies infinitely often I x must be greater than x over log x to the one plus epsilon. Showing that x over log x is really about the right growth rate. This was uh, 70 years before Gauss conjectured the prime number conjecture, which became the prime number theorem many decades later, when in 1896, Adamard and Villa, Villa, Valley, Poussin, independently in the same year, within months of each other, produced proofs of the prime number theorem. Independently. Mathematics was ready. Okay, so that's, I think, all I want to say about prime numbers. So now I want to tell you about Cantor. To show that the positive rationals are countable. Uh, that is, they can be listed. Q0, Q1, Q2, dot, 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 and every rational appears in that list. He also showed show that the reals were not, and he did an amazing amount to put the theory of infinite sets on solid footing, uh, was ridiculed and disbelieved by many major mathematicians at the time, ended up going, uh, having serious mental problems, and uh, some would say it contributed to an untimely device. So he, he proved this in the following way. This is around uh, 1870s. Uh, so You look at the positive quadrant of the integral axis. And he showed that if you count the lattice points in this order, this them in this order, you start with um, the point one one. And then the point one two, and then the point two one, and then one three, two two, three one, and so on. And he said, well, we can translate these pairs into quotients. And that will be a list 
with some extra stuff of all positive rationals. M over N will appear on the appropriate diagonal. You can figure out which one it is. And he says, and, and any repeats, two over two is the same as one over one. Let's just cross them out and shuffle, shuffle everything down. And that would give us a listing of the rational. Absolutely brilliant. Beautiful proof. Clearly the best possible proof. Well, I mean, the first part. I like to think I can show you some other proofs. Uh, in fact, let's show that there are uncountably many distinct groups. Well, let, let me show you one group first. Given A over B in Q plus, in lowest terms, uh, consider f of a over b, b two to the a three to the b, f of b plus. Is a subset of the natural numbers You can pull back the order that they appear in N, and that's the order you give the rationals in your listing. That lists them all. Uh, let me see, given A over B in Q plus in lowest terms. And suitable alpha, beta greater than one. And I'm going to gloss over what suitable is. Uh, transcendentally independent would certainly be enough, but it's overkill. Uh, F of A over B is alpha to the A, beta to the B. So we want to make sure that no two rationals get that to the same thing. That's what this suitable bit is. Here. It turns out they're easily shown to be alpha. There's uncountably many choices for alpha and beta. Uh, then the order type of this is n. Discrete subset of R. Uh, the fact that these are both bigger than one means that you can't get things that's too close together. And so the order type is N. Again, you can pull back order Q by using the So this gives uncountably many different listings. So in some sense, it gives uncountably many different groups of the countability of the rational. <coughs> Which I kind of like that, uncountably many of something countable. That's great. And I want to end with a nice observation. Uh, 
I'm going to grow a tree. Right? Like all good mathematicians, my tree grow downwards. So we have a root. It's a complete rooted binary tree, meaning that every node has two children. It's the binary. Complete means you don't ever get leaves. And I'm going to label it with positive rational. And the rule is A over B has children A over A plus B and A plus B over B. Notice that if I'm a rational less than one, I can go back from here to find the parent. If I'm a rational bigger than one, I can go back from here to find the parent. And if A over B is in lowest terms, then so are the children. If the children are in lowest terms, so is the parent. Okay, so I want to show that every rational appears exactly once in this tree. I'm going to, I, I, I call this proof by your mama. I'm going to look at that rational, I'm going to say your mama appeared exactly once in that tree. Therefore, you appear exactly once in that tree. Really a proof by induction. But I, I like to be able to give proofs by induction that are uh, irrational, but unspecialistic, non mathy audience can understand. And proof by your mama is just too good to be true. Uh, so now what do we do? That means every positive rational appears as a label. We just read the labels across like that. Now, I think that this proof, I mean, it's, it's only different from Cantor's proof. The ordering is different. One of the things I like about this is we can say, take a listing of the rational numbers positive rational, anyone you like. Could be cantors, could be this one, could be one of these uncountedly many. And I ask you, tell me the tens of the ten thousand rational. I believe that we will never know the answer here. Because it depends too subtly on which numbers you have to cancel out and how many of them there are. I believe we'll never know the answer here for other reasons. I'm pretty sure we'll never know the answer here. I can actually tell you what that is. It is a computation that takes very little time. It takes on the order of 10,000 matrix multiplications, two by two matrix multiplications. That's very quick. I could even make the 10,000 here quite a lot bigger and still be able to compute this in realistic time. So this proof is not only distinct, it actually allows us to do something that is more computational and allows us to explore questions of a, a more interesting nature. When, when you look at very big swaps, you can ask averaging questions and things like that. You can actually do the computation, whereas here you don't. Okay, so I, I hope that I uh, persuaded you that, that some of these proofs are Different from the others, and they they all have interesting, nice things to them. Often, being first is really huge. This was transformative. Showing that the reals were not countable was also transformative. Being first is huge. 
But sometimes doing <coughs> something again can be really, really worth it. With that, I say thank you for your attention. Okay, any questions? I, um, so I'm not from a math background, but I just have a question regarding the analytical tool for the infinitely many times existing. So you made a change that S goes to one from above. Yeah. Uh, what was the point of making that change? Uh, I wanted to say that there was an equality between the infinite sum of one over n to the s and the infinite product of one minus one over p to the s inverse. And then I used the fact of Euler that if, if you have that, that means the product of one minus one above p diverges. And Euler proved that if the product of one minus one upon p diverges, then the sum of one upon p diverges. I, I did some clever mathematics of Euler. Problems. Um, and the the s going from one from above was so that the infinite sum and the infinite product were identical for any s greater than one, and therefore the limits must diverge in the same way. Therefore, the infinite product must diverge. So, in the same way as in uh, as s goes, in the same way according to that. So, if, well, the products are identical. So, if the infinite sum diverges as s goes to one. And it diverges like one over s minus one, then the infinite product must diverge just like that. Oh, okay. Any other questions? Any questions from out there in nature land? Let's thank our speaker. Thanks. Man. Thank you all for coming. Thank you out there for coming. Next week, there will not be a math club because it's actually the day before homecoming. And if you're interested, the School of Mathematical Sciences, we're going to have a table out there for alumni. Roll on by, visit, it'll be a lot of fun. But the math club will resume uh, in two weeks. And I hope you all have a great weekend.